Design documents on Lab Three. Uh, those are uh, good. Good work on those. There was some uh, confusion about the general uh, kind of components of, of how this pipe is going to work. So I just wanted to, to lay it all out in a way that might be easy to understand. Now that you've had a chance to kind of think through what these different pieces might be. So, uh, for a pipe, life begins when a user calls the pipe system call. They pass in an array, it has spots for two integers, and they say open two files. One is going to be the read end of the pipe, one is going to be the write end of the pipe. Give them file descriptors and fill in those file descriptors into this array the user passed in. So, In whatever process is currently running, we have our open file table, index 0, and index k, and k plus 1, up to our uh, max index. I have proc max files minus 1, last index in our open array. The two file descriptors don't have to be adjacent. I'm just putting them adjacent for simplicity, but any two will work. And so when the user calls this pipe, the, uh, the pipe system call, what we're going to do is create two files And this diagram I'm drawing, by the way, is in the Lab 3 FAQ. It is now available on the course calendar. We're going to allocate two files. We have a function to do this. fs alloc file. You call that, it returns a pointer to a newly allocated file struct. So we use that to get these two. And these file structs have various things in them. What we care about are three specific fields. There's the open flag telling, uh, describing what mode this file was opened in. Is whoever opened this, is it allowed to be written? Is it allowed to be read? Before a read, we'd say this O flag is this FS read only macro, right, our read and our pipe, you should only be able to read from it. We don't want anyone writing to it. Similarly, our write end, we get the fs write only uh, value for its O flag. The write-up talks about this f ops field which is a struct of a, a pointer to a struct of function pointers. Which is to say that when you do a file operation, the system is going to use this struct to find the pointer to the function it should call. And we want to make sure that for our pipe files, those point to our pipe read pipe write and pipe close. And so the lab write-up shows the code for declaring this pipe ops struct and uh, the signatures for the pipe read, pipe write, and pipe close. And for any file that the pipe needs to uh, set up that point of approach. Last thing that is suggested by the write-up is 
is that these file structs contain a pointer, a generic pointer, a void star, that will refer to a struct for the pipe that we're creating. So the way to think about, or a, a good way to think about this struct is it's going to be our bounded buffer, this array that we're going to read and write the data uh, for the struct, plus some extra information. Uh, specifically, the behavior of a pipe depends on whether the read and write ends of the pipe are open or not. So if you try and write to a pipe, whose read end is closed, that should return error end. That should return a specific error saying you're writing to a pipe where the read end is closed. If you try and read from something that whose write end is closed, you read whatever data is in the pipe, if any, and if there isn't any, you return zero to indicate this is, uh, this is empty and there's nothing that you'll ever be able to read. So. But if the reason is, if the right end is closed, um, you shouldn't be like added to some queue so you can write after the other guy is finished, after the other writer is finished. So like, if you want to allow multiple writers and readers. Yeah. So this uh, is a point also addressed in the in the FAQ. Um, so let me. I, I, so I, I want to talk about that. Let me finish with uh, sure. the, the pipe struck. Uh, so. The kind of thing, the, the reason that the write up pointed to this blocking bounded uh, queue code that was in the condition variable notes is that this pipe is one of these bounded buffers. It is dealing with uh, bytes rather than, uh, with reading or writing multiple bytes at a time rather than inserting or removing single integers the way that the example uh, code is. But we can just make this pipe a bounded buffer that works slightly differently, meaning that it can use the same, it would actually be struct spin lock, but just for brevity, we're going to have a spin lock. We're going to have a condition variable. for each of the two situations where we might wait. So it might be the case that someone tries to write to this buffer, but it's full, and so they'll need to wait. Or someone tries to read from this buffer, but it's empty. Or it doesn't have as much data as they've asked for. And they will have to wait. And then in the pipe struct, we can then actually have the array where all this data is going to be written to and read from. So it's an array of bytes. So we'll make it type car of some fixed max size. And then the example code uses this nice strategy of keeping track of two integers that let us use this uh, buffer in a kind of elegant way. And those are called front and next empty. But the idea is we're going to keep track of the next index we're going to read from.
and the next index we're going to write to. And so we know that, okay, if front and next empty are equal, they're at the same spot, we have our, uh, we have some, uh, say, four element array uh, when next empty and front are at the same spot, there's nothing to be read. As there's kind of no, uh, uh, we, we would have to write something here before it could be read. If we write, say, the byte A and then the byte B, our next empty would then be 2. We'd be referring to this index. This is the next spot that we'll write. Front would be 0. Then when we read two bytes, front would be updated to two. And the neat trick here is if we mod these each by the size of our buffer, they'll wrap around back to the beginning. So we just keep adding to front and adding to next empty as we read or write, and by Doing the modular size, we'll just keep wrapping around, uh, and it would save us a lot of extra. It would save us some extra bookkeeping of if statements and resetting them to zero to get them to wrap around. The modular makes that uh, simpler. Kim, what if we like end out of the integer? Uh, yeah. So uh, that's uh, a good edge case to consider. Um, like so, uh, the the specification does not say what should happen at that point. Uh, there are different ways that you could uh, uh, you could have special case for if uh, the integer is already at the max positive value and you're about to add one, then you reset it to zero. Um, you could make it an unsigned type to give you more a bigger range of positive numbers. Uh, you can say, look, I just don't support pipes that are used that much, and the operating system is just going to crash when that happens. It's not an ideal design, but uh, there's no requirement that you handle that case. Uh, if we do this modular stuff and we've got the wrapping, isn't that like super dangerous? Because then you can have it could write past and overwrite stuff that the thing hasn't read yet. Yeah, so if you look at the code for the, the bounded buffer, uh, to, it actually says, uh, it, it says, it looks at the difference between these two without the modulo to say, are they at the same spot or not. But when they're used as an index, gotcha. we, we apply them on. Yeah. Um, so I think in the ramp, you have, you have like a bottom key from a structure, and you block, block the bottom key so you can like implement that as a separate data structure. Yes, so that's an alternative design to the one I have up here. When I have up here to say, okay, our pipe is going to be this bounded buffer plus some extra information. Instead of having all of these in the pipe, the pipe could have, say, uh, a struct BBQ in it, and you have separately kind of made this bounded buffer its own sort of data structure within the kernel. You wouldn't be able to use exactly the one in the notes because that one's dealing with adding and removing one integer at a time, and we need something that can do bytes. But yes, you don't. There's an alternative where you say, okay, this bounded buffer is actually going to be its own sort of data structure within the kernel, and the pipe is just going to use it rather than the pipe itself is the bounded buffer. Other questions on what's going on here? All right, uh, back to, um, uh, I guess, to fill in the last pieces. Uh, after these, these files have been created, this pipe needs to uh, make it so that these two file descriptors in the open file array point to these new files and then fill in the values of those file descriptors into the array the user passed in, 
And at that point, we have created the pipe. It's ready to for the user to start reading and writing. So that brings us to the question of, OK, when these files close, when, when the user closes parts uh, one or, or the other end of the pipe, what should happen? So an important part of that is to look at the code uh, for FS close file and take a look at what it does. And this is why reopening files, when they're copied over into the child uh, or duplicated, is really important because each file tracks how many times has this been opened or reopened. That's this reference count. So when you close a file, it subtracts one from this. And if it's still greater than zero, if some other process is still using this file, that's all we need to do. We just return. So it's only when Everyone who ever opened or reopened this file, when the last one of those processes closes it and the reference count goes to zero, only then do we call pipe close. That gets to tie this question about, well, when we close and the read or the write is open, we, there should be, it should be possible for multiple processes to be reading or writing. We don't want to start shutting things down prematurely. It's the case that your pipe close will only be called when the last process that's using that end of the pipe closes it. All the other ones, it will just subtract from the reference count and then return. So you know that when your pipe close is called on a particular file, no process is still using that file, assuming no bugs with the, the, the file table. I have a question. In the lab specifications, it said that if the read descriptor is closed, we should uh, just return whatever we have stored in a buffer. Uh, I'm not don't quite understand. Like, where is this buffer supposed to? Uh, that's this okay. buffer inside the pipe structure. Oh, like, so this is this data buffer here is what is being written to or read from uh, by all the pipe buffers. Okay, I see. So do we also need to call fs open file because of the reference count? Uh, In sys pipe. So you just need to allocate the file. Okay. Now you can uh, uh, dive into this to uh, uh, to look, but this fs open file. Uh, it calls fs alloc file. It otherwise does not initialize the reference count uh, because fs alloc file starts it off appropriately. Okay, thank you. Um, you also do not need to free the file struct because we can see that fs close file calls that for us. So the only thing you're responsible for freeing would be the pipe struct that you allocated whether call it the kmalloc or the kmem cache alloc. Uh, you used one of those to allocate this pipe struct when the pipe was created. So when, once you know that both ends are closed, that's when you would, you would free it up. Okay. Uh, just as a follow up to my last question, if uh, the read end is closed, we can still retrieve the bytes from the uh, character array data. Uh, then what difference does it make if it's closed? Like if we still do essentially the same operation. Uh, so you're saying, what if a process closes its read end and then tries to read from that? Yeah. Uh, so in lab one, when you implemented sysclose, yeah. that should have set that file descriptor entry to null. Yeah. And so if the process tries to read from that again, it should get back an error because it's like it no longer points to the, the structure of the, the read end. Yep. That makes sense. Thank you. Other questions? All right. There are a number of uh, other um, small.
smaller questions that are covered uh, in the FAQ, please take a look at that. Um, so, I actually will stay here. Uh, and we'll All right, so uh, what I, uh, one thing that I wanted to use today for is to talk about kind of high level uh, uh, guidelines about how to uh, write concurrent software. And we've been kind of talking about specific uh, tools, our locks, our condition variables, semaphores, uh, uh, reader writer locks, etc. And take a step back. Think about what are some guidelines we can follow when writing concurrent software uh, to make it more likely we, we write something correct. One basic component of this is we have some shared objects, some shared data structure uh, that multiple threads are going to be using. How should we design that such that it is thread safe, meaning that it will be correct even if multiple threads are uh, using its operations concurrently. And I'm using the term object here uh, in a very general way, so the structs that we're dealing with in C would sort of fall under this set of design principles, even though they aren't technically objects. So they don't have methods, uh, so I'll, I'll be using kind of object-oriented terminology, but it applies to the functions that are called with structs that uh, uh, you'll be writing in C. So we want to, so, yeah, Jim. So just a quick question. So like um, the, the function struct that, that we use in file logs, is that a, a analogous to uh, the, the, the function that belongs to an object in the, in the object object? Uh, yes, you can think of it as uh, when we set up those pipe operations, we're saying here is the version of the read, write, and close method that you should use for, for this for this object. So yeah, that would be one way to think of it. Uh, we have our sort of standard uh, object-oriented programming approach. We take our problem and decompose it into kind of the separate objects. Uh, And then think about what, well, let's design a kind of clean interface for each of these objects uh, and separate that from kind of any messy details of the underlying implementation. This is our standard object oriented approach. And when we are dealing with a shared object, all that's changing is we need to add synchronization this design. So here are some steps we can follow. Step one, add a lock. <laughs> Our object is shared, multiple threads are going to be accessing it, so we probably want a lock to prevent threads from overriding the updates of other threads uh, or otherwise allowing threads to access the object when it's in inconsistent state. And so for now, we're going to assume one lock per object, though so we'll get to, in a little bit, kind of more complicated designs where uh, violating that might be useful. Uh, and our 
our goal is to protect the state of the object. So there's typically just going to be all the objects fields, uh, all the variables inside it. Those are our shared state, and those are what we want to protect from concurrency problems using this block. Step two, add code to acquire and release the lock. This step might sound simple, but we have to think about, okay, where do we add, when do we acquire the lock, when do we release the lock? And I want to strongly encourage you to always start with Acquire the lock at the start of any public method and release it at the end. This is a really simple, very common approach. It makes it very easy to inspect the code and see if it is using the lock correctly. It allows private methods to assume that the lock is held, because they can only be called by public methods that acquire the lock. And you might be tempted to optimize the design of the object by avoiding holding the lock for some part of a method or say, oh, this method probably doesn't need the lock, so I won't require and release it there. And I would encourage you to resist this slick temptation because uh, before you start doing this optimization, you will want to have uh, analyze the program performance to determine that the locking is actually the bottleneck. Uh, you'll need to account for possible uh, instruction reordering by the compiler or the uh, CPU. And typically, acquiring a lock, a pretty inexpensive operation, reasoning about possible memory interleavings when you don't hold a lock is very hard. And so it's important to just start with this simple approach and then only if it has been demonstrated that this is a bottleneck, do the much harder task of trying to, to get fancy with it. Does that make sense? Step three. We want to identify and add condition variables. And our rule of thumb here uh, can be uh, one per kind of situation or event that we need to wait for. Uh, so in the blocking bounded queue I was just discussing, uh, it had two condition variables, one for waiting for a read to take place, one for waiting for a write to take place. Uh, one question we might ask is, could we have done that with just a single condition variable? Do we need two? Uh, so I'd like you to uh, take uh, a couple minutes and ponder with your neighbors in this blocking bounded queue. Do you, do we, would it be possible to do it for with one condition variable and what the consequences of that might be? Yeah, if we only have one. Alright. So, could, could we do this for uh, with only a single condition variable? Uh, yeah, but you'd have to broadcast to everyone. Yeah, so say, say more about that. So if you had the case where a read finishes reading, or a write finishes writing, and then, or either either case, and then sends a signal, ideally then the once a writer is finished, the reader will start. But if the next in the queue is another writer, then uh, and it's like 
you, you can end up in situations where it's not alternating back and forth. Um, and so you need to tell everyone that, like, hey, I'm finished. Uh, and then each person needs to kind of, each third needs to determine for itself whether it can start, which is inefficient. Yeah, we... Our, uh, instead of a, like, a read has happened or a write has happened condition variable, we have a something has happened condition variable. And as Tyler says, if we just signal one thread on that condition variable, it could be another reader, and we just, and, but we're trying to wake up a writer. Uh, and if we just signaled one, another reader wakes up, it can't make progress either, it goes to sleep, and now everyone's just waiting. Uh, and so, so the consequence is we have to, instead of signaling one thread, we always have to wake up everyone who's waiting on this condition variable. Uh, in case one or more of the threads waiting could make progress. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? All right. Also, uh, side note, Condition variable should always wait inside a loop, uh, particularly because uh, for some implementations there can be spurious wakeups. Uh, this is true of, of Java's built-in condition variables that you can be woken up, and it might not be the result of a signal on that condition variable. And so, both because maybe someone woke you up. But another thread won the race in his. Uh, now that what you're waiting for is, is no longer true, but it's also possible uh, in some cases that you could be woken up for no particular reason. Um, is this like to like stop it from? Is this like an intentional feature, or just like something that happens? Uh, I don't believe this is an intentional feature. Okay. Um, uh, I have not looked. Uh, I have not looked into the implementation details that cause uh, the, the Java condition variables to behave this way. Um, my guess is it's related to uh, some, uh, some signal being raised by the hardware sometimes for reasons it's not related, but I just haven't. And so step four, add signal or broadcast uh, calls. And a thinking through of what would be different about using one condition variable or two for a bounded buffer. And uh, gets at how we kind of make the decision, should we use signal or broadcast. In this case, we needed to use broadcast because we couldn't count on any one particular thread that we woke up being able to make progress. So that is the case that we have multiple threads waiting, and only some of them would be able to make progress. We then need to wake up everyone to make sure that we wake up at least one that can, can make progress. Why like, can't you do something where just like you wake if if you wake up and don't make any progress, you still just like chain the signal? Like can you also just like instead of broadcasting, can you just like chain signals through the variables? Uh, imagine the situation where we have uh, uh, two threads. Uh, one of them gets woken up spuriously. It can't continue, so it signals the other one. It can't continue. It signals the other one. It can't continue. It signals the other one. Um, so I think that would result in a lot of sort of churn uh, that uh, we could avoid by just uh, not trying to do this optimization of chaining signals rather than just broadcasting. Uh, I would I, I just expect typically that wouldn't actually save us much. All right, so these are kind of four steps if we're designing a shared object. Uh, 
use the locks and condition variables uh, we know and love. Uh, and kind of along with these four steps, uh, the notes uh, give a sort of summary of, of six best practices, which we've kind of covered as we, we've gone through these. Um, one nice thing about locks and condition variables is that they're in some ways self-documenting, where if we look at code, where a condition variable is waiting in a loop. We can look at the condition of the loop, and that just tells us what that thread is waiting for. We don't actually need to go look at some other code to tell under what conditions will this thread continue. It's right there in the while condition. Um, another thing to remember We always want to hold a lock when operating on a condition variable. Our condition variable has this list of waiting threads. And we know that if we have concurrent, say, inserts in a linked list, we might lose one of those inserts. Uh, and so we want to protect uh, that condition variable list uh, using a lock. This isn't specific to OSV since uh, sleep is, uh, since you won't be using thread sleep, but if you're writing concurrent software, uh, you should generally avoid the temptation of maybe this will work if I just have a, a thread wait for a set amount of time. That is what this thread sleep does. Like, oh, this thread needs to wait for someone else. So maybe I'll have it wait for a second, and surely the thing it's waiting for will happen by then. Uh, if you ever find yourself thinking that way, really you should be using a condition variable to wait for a specific thing to happen, not just waiting for a certain amount of time and crossing your fingers that things are going to work out. I, I have seen scary uh, fork wait implementations that Use no synchronization and just like lots of loops and checks to try and get things to work out like 90% of the time. <laughs> uh, better, better to use, use these tools. All right, so last time we talked about how uh, uh, we could, uh, for specific cases, uh, we might try and optimize for the, for the common case with our, our reader-writer locks, uh, for example, where we uh, wanted to, uh, to allow multiple reads to happen in parallel. Uh, but before kind of moving on to these more complex uh, kinds of locks, uh, we might consider uh, are there different, if our lock is a bottleneck, and we profile the performance of our program and identify, OK, it is the lock that is causing an issue. What are alternate designs that we might uh, explore to try and uh, relieve that problem? But before we explore those designs, uh, I need to tell you about US Grant, 18th president. Uh, I think one of uh, uh, a few presidents with a fake middle name. I don't think the S stands for anything. Um, and uh, uh, got uh, had a what uh, was a sort of a failure in the military uh, with sort of. Uh, Noticed out of the military, uh, like to do a drinking problem, uh, had several business ventures that failed, tried to be a farmer, that didn't go well. Uh, and then the US Civil War happened, and he goes back into the military, uh, and turns out to be 
uh, in many ways exactly the right person at the right time, uh, and is, is eventually becomes the uh, general in chief of the U.S. Army and sort of uh, architects the, the strategy uh, to uh, defeat the, the Confederacy, uh, and this uh, parlays into uh, widespread fame, and he gets elected as uh, uh, the he becomes president as the, the Republican Party's nominee. Uh, while president, he uh, pursues kind of reconstruction in the in the southern states, uh, aggressively uh, goes after the Ku Klux Klan, um, uh, supports uh, civil rights in the South. Uh, his administration is also plagued by scandals. It's something that uh, was a real uh, grant. Really, just like to assume the best in people and just sort of trusted them. Uh, this happens. Uh, this this was bad news for him as president. This was terrible news for him after uh, he uh, after his presidency, where he trusted this absolute scoundrel who just ran a Ponzi scheme and uh, lost. He, like all of he was basically broke uh, toward the end of his life as he was dying of cancer. Um, and as he was uh, dying, he furiously wrote his memoirs, which then became incredibly successful and kind of provided for his, his family after, after he died. <laughs> uh, so, very interesting guy, complicated guy. Um, and uh, unfortunately, his. Uh, by the end of his presidency, the, the country had really, uh, the, the political situation in the North had really soured on uh, Reconstruction and, and uh, ensuring civil rights in the South, uh, and, and his predecessors would not continue that kind of policy. All right, back to concurrency. So. Our lock, it's a bottleneck, what do we do? I want to talk about four different strategies, uh, uh, which all of which bear some kind of uh, sort of a uh, conceptual relationship be between them. The first is fine-grained locking. They say, instead of having one lock that a bunch of feds are fighting over, maybe we could have many locks on smaller parts of our shared data and thus reduce how uh, much contention, how much fighting there is for any particular lock. Uh, and the OSTEP reading for today goes through uh, several nice applications of this. Uh, approach and along with some performance benchmarks to show um, their effect. Uh, and so one of the structures that the reading touches on as an example is a concurrent hash table. We have a hash table that multiple threads are using. And if we have a single lock, then a thread uh, adding a key value pair to the hash table prevents another thread from getting a value of the hash table, even if the two, the two keys involved are, are totally unrelated. Uh, so our sort of fine-grained locking approach is Instead of having one lock for the whole hash table, we'll have a separate lock for basically every index, every bucket in our hash table. So if you remember from your data structures class, hash table, we have an array, maybe some array of, of linked lists. And then anytime we put a key in, we hash the key to get an integer, turn that integer into an index into our array, and that's the spot in our hash table that we uh, insert the value. I guess that's our kind of constant time. Any key, we can just constant time find the spot where it goes. 
And so these different spots where keys can go, let's just have a separate lock for each of those. And so now adding key A doesn't prevent another thread from getting key M, because they have separate locks. Uh, this gets a little complicated when we're resizing uh, the hash table. We need to change the number of buckets. Uh, there are uh, different uh, different ways of uh, approaching that. Um, so one uh, nice uh, uh, solution for this is actually to use, we keep our separate logs for each bucket, but then the whole hash table gets a, uh, a reader-writer lock. And resizing is the only time, is the only thing that counts as a writer. And so this means that when we need to resize this table, no other thread can be using it while we're changing the number of buckets. But otherwise, all other operations count as sort of a, a reader because they're not changing the underlying structure of the hash table. They're just inserting or, or retrieving values. Questions on this fine grain locking? Does this make sense? So, one question for you. Let's say we have a bunch of threads that all are using some shared heap. They're all calling malloc or free to do stuff uh, with the heap. And if we add a single lock to the entire heap, uh, these threads, only one thread could be mallocing or freeing at a time, and they would all sort of fight over this one lock. And so if that's a performance problem, is there some way that we could use fine-grained locking, this sort of fine-grained locking approach, to make, uh, to make our malloc and free uh, have better parallelism. So take a few minutes, brainstorm with your neighbors. Uh, could we, is there some way we can use fine grain locking? Uh, this, this idea of let's have multiple locks uh, or different pieces to, to apply to mallet and free. Mm -hmm. uh, All right. Thoughts or, or questions about doing fine grain locking on our on our heap? Uh, we kind of thought we could just put like a lock for each like split mid those things like four sections have a lock for each section, and then when you malloc something, you're going to start traversing the sections, and you start with like you're going to be in the explicit free list, I think it's called. And you'll start somewhere, you get that lock, and then as you move through it, you have to acquire other locks. And then for freeing, you just have to get the lock of the section that you're freeing from. Yeah, I, this is exactly kind of how we would generally do this fine grain locking. It's, let's take this one big resource and divide it up into different regions or different pieces, and then That way we can have a separate lock for each of those pieces. And how we actually implement this in terms of which region gets used uh, when someone calls malloc. Uh, Maybe we have some system where we rotate through which region gets used with each call to malloc, or we keep track of which region has the most available space, and that's the next one to be used. Uh, uh, but the uh, idea being that, all right, now malloc and freeze in this region can happen at the same time as the ones in this region. We don't uh, have to have a single lock that only lets one thread go at a time. Jimmy? Oh, yeah, so I'm just wondering if in in this model, of course, then you can have data all over the network. But you can have data in lock one, lock two, lock three, lock four. 
uh, you could, there would be a way to, so yes, I think that that would work. Um, I don't think there's, uh, like when, uh, as a user, I call malloc and get back a, back a chunk of memory, and then I call malloc again and get back a different chunk of memory, I can't make any assumptions that these chunks are close together or far away in the heap. The heap, the heap allocators can give me a chunk somewhere. Um, so it would be fine if they were in different sections. Uh, you could use maybe like the thread's ID to determine which section it uses, and now a particular thread only uses a particular section. That would be another approach. All right, to talk about kind of other approaches that we can use when we have uh, a lock as a bottleneck. Uh, a sort of similar idea to fine grain locking says uh, however many processors we have, let's split our shared data into that many pieces, and then each processor will operate on a particular piece. So we take our hash table, and if we have four processors, we split it into four separate tables. Uh, each table has its own its own lock, uh, but now a thread one, running on one processor can uses that processor's uh, uh, version of uh, that processor's table, um, and this will be. Put in the end parts for NCPUs. This will if this strategy results in these different CPUs having to uh, do a lot of communication, wait for, like, go access the version, the the, um, uh, the part on another processor, that's actually going to kind of create more overhead than this, than this saving. So this sort of approach works well when these different parts aren't going to be needing to be coordinated in, in some way. Uh, and for our, for our hash table, we take some range of keys, and put that on just one processor and arrange it so that the thread running on that processor is the one dealing with these kind of keys, then we don't have a lot of, kind of cross communication and this might work pretty well. We have something called the ownership design pattern, which is the idea that each object, each piece of data that we're dealing with is accessed by, is owned by only one thread. If only one thread is uh, reader writing this particular piece of shared data, then we don't need any locks at all because we don't have any concurrency within a particular uh, piece of data. So uh, you might, as an example of this, you might have. different stages of 
our program. Like a web server, we have a network stage where connections are coming in, and one thread handles one connection. And then we have one of these bounded buffers, like a queue, that passes information from the network stage into a into the parse stage, which has its own pool of threads. And when one thread kind of takes a network request out of this queue, it's the only one that deals with that request. This is our kind of ownership. One thread uh, owns one object. Uh, and this, there's a, uh, the fourth uh, approach is a very similar idea. Called staged architecture design. We're going to separate our program into these different stages. And the difference between our ownership design pattern and our staged architecture design is kind of the emphasis uh, of the approach. So in this ownership, we're saying one thread controls uh, owns one object, so we don't need locks there. Here, our stage architecture design says we're going to have these separate stages, each with their own pool of threads. Uh, and since each of these stages is sort of modular, we might get better uh, cache performance. Uh, we could even have kind of different uh, teams, different companies working on these different parts of our system. <coughs> Uh, and by separating out of these different stages, we kind of reduce the uh, contention for uh, any particular piece of shared data. All right, out of time. Uh, so I hope the lab tree FAQ is helpful. Uh, uh, oh, lab, uh, quiz three uh, for this week canceled. Uh, so no quiz uh, due Monday. Uh, why don't you have a, a more time to think about the lab over the weekend? Uh, I will see you on Monday. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Aaron. Bow, my sister. Nobody knows just how it started. Somebody.